Good evening, everyone. So um, if you've joined us before, you know that this is literally the international community of individuals because we are spanning the globe here. I know from Australia to South America, across Europe, the UK, of course, and uh, North America and many other places as well, Norway. Um, and if you have come for, is there, is there anyone, give me a wave if this is the first time you've joined us. Hi, special welcome to you. Very well, very, very pleased to see you. We've had a, uh, numbers of new people asked to, to join since the, the, we said, look, come as a guest. And I'm really, really delighted about that. And for those of you that haven't picked up on it, you can also get my philosophy course if you contact Jessica, because um, I wanted to make sure that was available to everyone during these, these times. So I suggested last week we do something unusual. So at the ICU meetups, some of them are, are experiential, where we do meditation and gazing together. We did that last week. And the, and the others are what I call uh, wisdom wake-ups. So we're, we're coming together usually to discuss individualism. But at this special one, because it's Easter, um, I thought it might be interesting, and there was a, uh, people really liked the idea, to have a special on my older work. So this one, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to get as much information across as clearly as I can in the short period we've got. Uh, and then we'll have some questions and we can explore it. So that's the plan. So settle in and here we go. So for those of you who don't know, um, my most successful book by a long way is a book called The Jesus Mysteries, which I wrote with a dear friend of mine, Peter Gandhi. It was out in 1999 and it was a bona fide international bestseller. Um, it actually genuinely did get in to the, it was number six on the full Amazon chart, which surprised the hell out of us. And we were made the surprise bestseller for a while. Didn't quite get into the number 10 on the Times, although the book cover says we did. We were kept out by Monica Lewinsky's autobiography. So we came in at 11. And that was an interesting phase. And what I want to do now is talk about um, what was in that book, what was in the follow-up book, the Gospel of the, uh, sorry, the Jesus and the Lost Goddess and also the, the later books afterwards, which I've left behind now. Now, I want, oh, please be kind to me. This is 20 years ago that I did this work. It was a very intense period. Um, hopefully, I still know it very well. But if there's any blanks in my memory, don't be surprised. It felt very important at the time. I have moved on. My attention has not been on this. I have not kept off, up with the latest research. As far as I know, there's nothing that's come up which would make me change my mind. But I haven't, I haven't, this is not a running project for me. This is something which really came to a close about 2005, maybe a bit later, 2010. So I'm going to do three things tonight. I'm going to give you a very condensed version of what I have come to understand is the actual history of the origins of Christianity, this religion which has dominated the whole globe and especially the Western culture. I want to give you an idea of what the real message of Christianity was, in my view. And I want to unpick its mythology and show how that message is embodied in the story of Jesus, and not just the story of Jesus, but the story of the Christian goddess, Sophia, whose name you may not even know. I certainly didn't when I was studying this for the first time. So the essential thesis of the Jesus Mysteries, and I'm not going to be able to lay out all the evidence. If you want the evidence, it's all there, heavily notated in the books. It will sound uh, extreme, I'm sure, if you're not used to it. Um, but it's essentially this. We have grown up believing that this miraculous story of a man who walks on water and comes back from the dead is a true story of an historical event. And if you believe it's a true story of an historical event, you'll be saved. And if you don't, you'll be damned. Many people have rejected that idea that it's an historical event. I'm coming from a bit of a different place. I also don't think it's an historical event, but I do think it's a very significant story. It sounds like a myth. And I think it's because it is a myth. In fact, it's not just a myth, it's a very, very old myth. It's a myth which goes back, right back through uh, a thousand years of evolution back into ancient Egypt. So what you find in the ancient world in which Christianity emerged, 
we, we have this idea of Christianity sort of arriving in uh, Israel, like this little tiny little thing which is uh, cellophane wrapped, it's Israel, and Christianity arrives from Judaism. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Judaism itself was very much enmeshed into the Roman world. The Roman world had grown from the Hellenic world, and you had one Hellenic culture. Everyone spoke Greek, which is why all the Gospels are written in Greek, by the way. None of them are written in anything but Greek. And it was a culture which had within it things which were called mystery religions or mystery schools. And they were initiatory schools which led you to an, a state of gnosis, awakening. Gnosis means knowledge. It's Greek. It means knowledge. You, you, you came to know something, but mystical knowledge. You came to know God, essentially. And at the heart of all these mystery schools, which were all very different and various, was, a, was allegorical myths. Myths that were understood by initiates to be about the, the spiritual journey and were unpicked to understand how they needed to transform to make the spiritual journey to Gnosis. And a very common motif in these myths was a story of a dying and resurrecting son of God. In fact, if you go through these myths, you will find all the elements that later become the Jesus story. So it's a son of God who is born in a cave or a stable as we now have it, but it's cave in the, in the actual Greek. Uh, born of a virgin. Uh, comes into the world with a teaching of love, has 12 disciples, turns water into wine at a wedding, the whole thing, right the way through to dying at Easter and resurrecting, sometimes through crucifixion. And if you haven't seen the cover of the book, this is the paperback version, uh, which is, but you can just about make out perhaps that figure, it's an amulet, are uh, this figure of a crucified man uh, with some Greek by it. And it looks like Jesus, but it isn't. It's Orpheus Bacchus, which is a name for one of the names for this dying and resurrecting pagan god-man. So he has many names. So Dionysus is one, Os Osiris is one, Serapis, Adonis, Attis. And each culture is developing its own version of these myths. No, that no one myth is the Jesus story. It's, but it's like a, 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 a collection of motifs that come together in different forms. To, to quote Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, he says that these myths all have the same anatomy. They're not the same story on the surface. The example we use in the book is if you take Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story. On the surface, you think, oh, they're completely different. You go underneath the surface, they're exactly the same. And it's the same with these myths. So that's the first thing. The story which we have as a miraculous story of Jesus is actually a very, very old story, which has been used as a spiritual allegory for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, the other thing to add into that next is the existence of Gnostic Christians. In fact, for us, when we wrote the book, what happened was we were studying two things, which we thought were separate. Peter and I were studying pagan, pagan mystery schools, and we were studying Gnosticism. And at a certain point, we realized these are the same thing. Uh, so ancient Christianity is not the Christianity which you were taught at Sunday school. Actually, uh, there is, by the second and third century, there are two competing versions of Christianity, which we call literalists and Gnostics. Now, those are our terms. They all, none of them use that term, not even the Gnostics. They all call themselves by the te their teacher's name or whatever group they were in. But there, you can clearly see them fall into two groups. And what marks out the literalists, which we don't see arising until the second century, is that they have this idea, and it's a completely new idea. They have this idea that this story actually happened. And it happened in... Judea and their pitch is really interesting because they are absolutely aware that the story they're telling has been around a long time so they know this it's obvious to them so it's a big shock it was a big shock to me when I found that out 
It's a big shock to most of us, but it wasn't a shock to them. And they were being accused. I mean, we have, we have texts in which they're accused of, you're just telling the same, you know, they're saying, you're saying you have a new story, but it's just the same story. And their reply is, yes, but your story is just a story. Ours actually happened. A man came and lived out the story. And that's their sales pitch. And I'm not being mean when I say that's their sales pitch. I actually think that's kind of right. That what was happening, certainly by the second century, is in the Roman world, it was very much like today. It was kind of like, a, like a, a, all these different cults going off, like the New Age. And so it was very much that kind of, oh, you know, have you, have you been initiated into the Isis mysteries? Oh, very good. Yes, I did that. Have you done the Mithras? Oh, I'm really getting into Mithras. And you see, you can see all these things going off and these people bringing bits into Rome. And, and here's a cult trying desperately. And this is the true meaning of the word cult. This is literally a cult trying desperately to get off the ground. And its great new thing is, hey, we're different. So that's the literalists. But even the literalists, and this is really interesting, I think, the early literalists, I'm talking about people like uh, Tertullian and Polycarp and Justin Martyr, they completely acknowledge the other stories. And they also say, the world is full, I think this is Tertullian, might be Polycarp, the world is full of Gnostics. It's terrible. These other Christians, they, they, they talk about them as a much bigger group which is really interesting so who are these gnostics that were a bigger group and what did they believe well their great heresy for which they were later eradicated brutally is that they do not believe jesus came in the flesh they're completely the opposite of the literalist christians they think that they are practicing a new form of a mystery cult. They talk in the language of the mysteries. They have a stages of initiations like the mysteries. And their whole teaching is, this is allegory. This is a, this is a story containing teachings that can lead you to gnosis. Now, the way that the mystery, story, the mystery traditions would work is that there was an outer mysteries and an inner mysteries. And you can think of them in modern terms like religion and spirituality, if you like. There's the outer form. And when you get the outer form, it would just be the stories. And I'm sure a lot of people, even in the pagan world, really believed that Dionysus came and did these things. And they were literalists too, quite probably. Maybe the vast majority. And then there were the inner mysteries. And when you were ready, the master, or sometimes mistress, I'll come on to that later, or often actually, priestess, would take you aside and would say, right, you're ready to be initiated into the inner mysteries. And the inner mysteries are about within. And they take it to a whole new level and you're basically you're sat down and they're going, right, this is what it's actually about. So for instance, you know, when Dionysus or Osiris is torn into shreds in the myth, this is the spreading of spirit throughout the universe, for example. And you'd, get, you'd learn these inner mysteries and then you'd start your journey and you'd realize, oh, that story was all about you. And this is what's happening also in the, the, the mysteries of Jesus. So what is actually going on here? Well, the story, you know, history, as they say, is always written by the winners, isn't it? So the bit of history that we know is that this little cult of literalists are going to grow. And they're going to be picked up eventually by the Roman Empire. Constantine is looking, much later on, is looking for a, a religion to unite the empire, which is falling to bits. And his mum has become a Christian. This is very common. Often uh, widowed women would support all these cults. They would pour money into them and they'd keep them going. They would get into religion. And she got into Christianity, literalist Christianity. Uh, and Constantine decided to pick up on this and made it the religion of the state. And, if, and he didn't enforce it horribly. That was later, but he did enforce it. That was going to be the religion of the state. As it became enforced, it then became the only religion. And we moved from a very open, quite tolerant, uh, you know, a bit like India today, you know, everything's going on. That's the way the ancient world was. We moved to there is one God, there is one religion. And we had the Holy Roman Empire. So basically, I think I can say with complete justification, Christianity was picked up and put to use by a fascist empire. 
the archetypal fascist empire, and it became in many ways a fascist religion. It eradicated all of its opposition, the Gnostics, the Jews, and the pagans. And if Carl Sagan is right, it put us back a thousand years. He was of the opinion that if that hadn't happened, if paganism had developed along the lines of Platonic thought and so forth, we would have probably been to the moon a thousand years earlier. But we didn't. We got the Dark Ages. So if that, that, that history that we have picked up on is the history given to us by the Romans, by the Roman church. And all the things, most, the vast majority of forms of Christianity since have, have been offshoots of the Roman church. And very centrally, they've taken the book, the Bible, the New Testament and the Old Testament, which didn't exist, you know, the Jewish. Partly why the Old Testament's there, I think, is because it doesn't contain all the pagan stuff. So you can't see the references. So one of the key things to understand is that in the ancient world, before the Bible was put together, there were hundreds of Christian gospels, of which we now have quite a few, at least fragments, bits. A whole library you probably heard was found in Egypt at a place called Nag Hammadi. Someone had buried it. Why they buried it? Because they were worried that they were going to be killed. They probably were killed because they never came back for it. So we now have all of these other Gospels, and we have also the names of many, many of these Gospels. Interestingly, we have one guy, Celsus, I'm jumping here, but this is interesting, who names all of these Gospels, and every single one is credited to a woman. That's interesting. Also, one of the great complaints by the literalists is that the Gnostics allow women to be bishops and to be priests. Where's all this coming from? Well, I think here is, I think has actually happened. I think at a certain point, forget the year zero, there is no year zero, probably 200 years BC. We see the beginnings of what will be a new cult, which is a crossover between Judea, the mysteries of, in the Jewish tradition, which is the mystery of Moses, which is itself seeing the idea of Moses coming from the promised land. That's, a, that's an initiatory allegory about coming to Gnosis. Now, who is the figure in the myth of Moses that takes you to the promised land, which is Gnosis? It's not Moses, he dies. It's Joshua. What's Greek for Joshua? Jesus. They're taking the mysteries of Jesus and then they're combining it with the mysteries of Osiris and Dionysus and Serapis and Adonis. And, they're, and why are they doing that? Because their whole culture is embedded in paganism. Now, my suggestion is this is being done probably in Alexandria in Egypt. Nothing to do with Israel whatsoever, which is why all the, all the Gospels are written in Greek. You've got to think by then there's a big, it, Alexandria is like the New York of the ancient world. 25% of the population is Jewish. Everyone speaks Greek. So they're writing in Greek and they are in, are, they're in the middle of this ancient pagan civilization, Hellenic Egyptian civilization, and they're, murder, they're doing what we do today. They're taking what's good and they're trying to combine it with what they've already got. And what they come up with is a whole new Jesus. And they have, they, they, it's no longer the genocidal Joshua who goes into the promised land and kills everything. It's now the pagan godman who brings this message of forgiveness and reconciliation and of love. So that what you see is a combination of Jewish and pagan motifs being practiced by a mystery school. And we probably can even say who that mystery school is. Uh, because around outside Alexandria, there was a group called the Therapeuti, from which we get therapy. And the Therapeuti were clearly practicing Jewish mysteries. The, the person who tells us about them is called Philo the Jew, the Judeus, Philo Judeus. But interesting, he's got two names. He's often referred to also as Philo the Pythagorean. Now Pythagoras is the Buddha of the ancient world. All of this is Pythagorean thought. That's ubiquitous. Plato is Pythagorean thought. And 
these Jews are clearly Pythagoreans. Why? They dress in white, which is what the Pythagoreans do. They're vegetarians, which is what the Pythagoreans do. And they treat women as equals, which is incredibly, I mean, I can't, I mean, that's extraordinary in the ancient world, but they do. And what we see coming from them is a Gnosticism, many different forms of Gnosticism, not just one, but like all scattergun. Some are nice, some you wouldn't like so much, some are very aesthetic, some very like free love and all sorts going on. But what they have in common often is this, uh, that it's about your experience of Gnosis, that, they're, that they are allowing women to be bishops and leaders of the ecclesia, the community, and that have a combination of Pythagoreanism and in this case, Judaism, so that we have a new figure embodying the same thing. So, a little bit, I have to say a little bit, don't I, about the Gospels. The, the Gospels are not histories. I don't think a single scholar, unless they're you know, working for the church, uh, even, even then, would possibly think they're histories. They're faith documents. And they've evolved. This is not our work. This is scholars since uh, the Protestant Reformation. We can now see the first, there's three Gospels are basically the same Gospel. They've been copied and then bits have been added which tells you two things. One is it was okay to add bits. All of these Gospels, in my view, are Gnostic. All of them. But they've been added to later by people with a political agenda when they're not Gnostic. But the origins is Gnostic. So you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the same ones. Um, uh, Mark is the earliest. The earliest versions of Mark uh, are sayings combined with certain amounts of, you know, like uh, some geography, but all of that's been added. They now think the original was just a collection of sayings, and those sayings are called Sophianic sayings. They are very similar to the Cynic sayings, which is basically the, the, the philosopher, the Philosophia, is the mouthpiece for Sophia, who's the goddess of wisdom. And so these are sayings from Sophia, which come through the mouth of the philosopher, who in this case is portrayed as Jesus. And then that is added to, and then... Blah, blah, blah. And then, and then you go to a lot of the Gnostic Gospels. They're so cosmological and far out, you couldn't possibly think for one minute that they were history or ever meant to be. So what am I suggesting? I think the Jews did what every other culture had done. They merged their tradition with the, the pagan mystery tradition, and they created a new thing called Christianity. By the time um, we get to the very first Christian text, the very first text we have is Paul, his letters. He is held up as a great... Uh, attacker of the Gnostics because there's a numbers of fake letters from Paul. Again, this is not my research. These letters don't appear to the second century. In the second century, you get Paul going, don't listen to those Gnostics, it's falsely so-called. <laughs> and women, wear hats in church <laughs> and all of that. But if you go back to the early letters, which are clearly written by somebody else, because they're hundred, you know, they're much earlier, they're in the first century. He writes in the language of the pagan mysteries. He's clearly initiate. And he's the great hero of the Gnostics. The Gnostics see Paul as one of the great teachers. Valentinus, who's a great Gnostic teacher, she says, look, I got it from Thudas. I got the Gnosis from Thudas. Thudas got it from Paul. Paul is known as the great apostle, the great apostle. And the interesting thing about the original Paul is there's no mention of an historical man. In fact, when he says, what's the great secret? He doesn't say, oh, Jesus came. And no. he says, the great secret is Christ in you. That's the great secret. That's what it's about. It's about discovering the Christ in you. That's what he's interested in. So what does that mean? All right, let's get into a little bit of Christian Gnostic theology. Let's see if we can make sense of that for a bit. So the, the centerpiece of Gnostic philosophy or theology is the same as for the pagan mysteries very famously on the uh, in delphi the oracle at delphi had the words gnothi seton know yourself written above it this is the great injunction know yourself so it's all about self-knowledge that's what the gnosis is so what does it mean to know yourself well for the gnostics and those of you that know my work will know i've carried this on they divide the human being up into three very obvious aspects and they're just describing the obvious. The first, well, the three is physis, 
psyche and pneuma. Those are the Greeks. Physis is the body. Physical, that's where we get physical from. The first thing you are is a body. The second thing you are is a psyche. That's Greek for word for the word soul. Body and soul. What's the difference? And this was a huge moment for me in my own development, was just seeing the obviousness with what they were doing. They're going, look, you're experiencing sensation, the body in the world, and you're experiencing imagination. You're experiencing an immaterial or non-material or trans-material experience all the time. Thoughts, images, dreams, all that experience you have is where you're understanding the meaning of these words right now. You are a body and a soul. There's no doubt about it. You can't miss it. There's nothing to debate. It's just true. Look, that's, the, that's what you are. And then there's this third element, pneuma, which means spirit, uh, is, is the normal translation. Um, the other word that sometimes gets used is the word nous, which means Noah. So what's that? Well, it's referring to the Noah. It's why it's a good translation. It's referring to your deepest being. And it's what you're experiencing right now as the thing which is witnessing, looking and listening, all the sensations, and witnessing thinking and imagining and dreaming and all of that. So it's going, your, your two types of experience are of body and soul. And then there's this third thing, which is the experiencer of all of that. And many of you will have heard me quote numbers of times as one of my favorite gospels is the gospel of Thomas, which if you don't know it, I recommend it because there's some good, great little bits in it. And one of the things is that Jesus says, I will reveal to you what you cannot see, what you cannot hear, what you cannot touch and what you cannot imagine. Paul says the same thing. It's, the, it's obviously the initiatory thing that they say. He says it too. And what is that? It's your being. And this is the same thing that you will find in all the traditions of the mystical traditions. Your essential being is formless, is a formless presence within which everything's arising. That's what you are. That's your spirit, your essence, your being. So the program of initiation was, first of all, you started as what they called a hillock, which means a materialist. You start as a materialist and you start your spiritual journey and you think, I'm my body, this is me. And then you go through the first initiation, which is called the psychic initiation, which does nothing to do with being psychic necessarily. It means the soul initiation. And that initiation is when you make the jump from going, I'm my body, to, oh, I'm actually this non-material thing called a soul. That's what I am. And I have a body. But I'm not the body. This will, you know, the body will live and die. But what I am is the immortal soul. So the first level of initiation was to move into identification with the soul. So the, and, and do it now. Just make the switch. Just actually play with that. Just going, I'm actually a soul in a relationship with the body. I'm this non-material personal aspect of what I am. That's, what I, that's, that's more intrinsic to what I am than the body. That's that, that's that step for them. And then the next step is the pneumatic or spiritual initiation where you make another jump. And this is much more like non-dual spirituality now. The first is, is about... Is about the individual, and this point, this is where you're making the jump beyond the individual, and you're going. Oh, my being is not even. You know, for me, it's like it's not. A, it's not just. I'm not. A, there's a deeper aspect than the body, which is Tim. There's a deeper aspect than Tim, which is this presence of being, and the great teaching at the heart of every mystical tradition, and right there in Gnosticism, as in all the pagan mysteries is that because your deepest being has no form, it's one with all being. So when you hit, when you become conscious of your deep being, 
you're actually becoming conscious of God. You're actually becoming conscious that you are one with everything. And that's the gnosis. That's the pneumatic initiation, the spiritual initi initiation. And that is what the, in, the in pagans' religion was called the Dionysus in you, the Osiris in you, and in the, the new Jesus mysteries, it's called the Christ in you. The Christ just means it's Greek for Messiah. It's basically a king. It's like the, the ruling principle in you. That's what it is. So the whole journey is about discovering the Christ in you, finding what in the East would be called the Atman or the Buddha nature. Finding that highest being, which is beyond your individuality. That's what the whole journey is about. Now, Paul, let's just have a little bit of Paul again. The much maligned Paul. He says very clearly, and it's quite confronting actually, in one of his letters, he goes, you are not a Christian if you do not know the Christ in you. A Christian isn't someone who believes a whole lot of things for him. A Christian is someone who knows that they're one with the universe. That they're a individual. <laughs> that's, that's what it is to be a Christian. You know the Christ. And if you know the Christ, what's the hallmark of that? Love. When you know you're one with all, there's this love for all. And the early Christians call it agape. It's the Greek word for what I call big love. It's a journey to transcend one's individual nature and find this enormous oneness and love. That's what the whole thing is. Then you become a Christian. That's the, that's the very the essence of it. And you do it through a process of theoria, which is where we get the word theory from. But in this, originally it meant contemplation and more like meditation. You, just, you, you put your attention back before all experience in one Gnostic text. Is, is what it says. Okay, what the hell has all that got to do with the Jesus story and Easter? Doesn't sound much like it does, does it? I'm going to, in the next 20 minutes or so, before I'll stop and we'll let us chat, um, I want to have a, have a stab at dealing with some of the very rich allegorical nature of the story. But before I do that, I have to introduce you to somebody else, and that's Sophia. She also has many other names, but Sophia is the most common. I'm a philosopher. My name, I'm a lover of Sophia. That's what I do. Sophia is the goddess of wisdom. And when the Gnostics took the story of the father and son, they also took the story of the mother and daughter. And I'm going to tell you what those two, all those things mean. So in the pagan world, they also have this story of uh, the most famous one is Demeter and Persephone, which means basically mother and daughter. And Persephone falls down into, uh, she falls from heaven into the underworld, which is where we live, the world of shapes and forms and suffering. Uh, and she's rescued and she gets to escape. And it's a myth about your own soul. That's what it's about. So Sophia represents the soul and Jesus represents spirit. That's basically the allegory that's going on in all of these myths. And to understand, really to understand the Jesus story, you have to keep it alongside the Sophia story. Sophia's story, there's lots of versions, but one version is she's living in her father's house and then she goes, she, she, she wanders off looking for love in all the wrong places. And she falls into the earth and she becomes abused and, and, and raped and has a terrible time. And then she calls out for help to her father and her father sends her brother, stroke lover, which you can be in myths, but not in real life. And uh, down comes Jesus and rescues her. And this is an al this, this, that simple allegory, which has been completely, you know, just the Roman church just got rid of the whole thing. <laughs> it's still in there, as you'll see, but it, they got rid of the whole thing. It is incredibly central to the original Christians. 
So, in, you know, you can just see in that, before we move on to the Jesus story, what that's about, I'm saying this, they have an idea. Let's start with the father. Let's start, let's start with the big cosmic version. Hang on, I'm going to try and put this in an order that I can tell it quicker. Their basic myth is there are two principles, a male principle and a female principle, God and goddess. This goes right the way back through the ancient world. Those represent formless essence and form. That's what they are. One is the dreamer, one's the dream of life, of existence. So who's the goddess? She is the whole universe. Everything which has form, anything which has a quality. You've probably seen pictures of Nuit, you know, the Egyptian goddess, the night sky with all the stars. She is everything. That, they saw that as a canopy, like a cave. And we are all within it. She's everything. And then who, what is God? Well, in their idea, it was that the, 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 those stars that we see, they weren't big balls of gas. They were holes in the canopy. And you could see through the holes the light beyond. That's God. We're in the cave. This is Plato's cave or Pythagoras's cave. We're, we're living in amongst the world of shades. And for them, we fall. It's a, it's a myth of the fall, which is just about all religions have been up until quite recently. It's a, they, you've fallen from the, the, what was called the treasure house of light, the light beyond God. You've fallen into identification with the body and you're suffering and you will suffer until you turn around and you ask for help. So the key motifs there is sin and redemption, which are actually very profound words, even though they're used so horribly now. So the word for sin is um, hamartia, which comes from archery. And it means you miss the point. You miss where you're trying to hit. So Sophia falls into sin. She, she's looking in the wrong places. She doesn't know what she's doing. And th this is all of us, men and women. Every soul comes in, finds itself here, doesn't know what's going on, gets lost, suffers, until it experiences metanoia, which is translated as um, uh, uh, repentance. And metanoia means you change, you change your perspective. So you're doing this and you keep missing the point and you turn around and you go, help me. And most people on a spiritual journey have had that moment where they suddenly go, I'm lost, help. And that's Sophia, that's the soul calling out for help. And what comes is the wisdom to set you free, especially from your own deeper being, which is represented by the Christ, by Jesus. So that's a very potted, it's a very complex myth, actually, but there's a potted version. So what that's saying is, look, the, the, the God principle and the, the goddess principle are embedded in us. There is, a, there is a world soul or a cosmic soul, and there's a cosmic being, and we are fragments of it. And the initiatory process is to bring us back into oneness with the cosmic soul and the cosmic being. So now let's look at the Jesus story. Well, first of all, he's born of a virgin in a cave, right? So the cave, what's the cave? Well, I've just told you, the cave is Plato's cave. It's new it. And who's the virgin goddess? Well, in pagan mythology, the virgin goddess is the goddess who brings souls back into to reincarnation. It's the goddess of justice. So later, Jesus will be on the right hand of God, where you escape the cycle of reincarnation. And she's on the left hand, bringing you back in. No, more to do. Come back in. So she's the virgin goddess in the, in the story. That's Mary. Mary, there's two key Marys. One is the virgin mother and one is the fallen and redeemed Mary Magdalene. Those are the two aspects of Sophia, Demeter and Persephone. Demeter, the mother, the virgin mother, and then Persephone, or, or what they call the lower Sophia, who's the soul who gets lost and needs to be redeemed. And Jesus will do that in the story, will redeem the soul. So Jesus comes in, starts with a star. What did I just say about a star? A star is a hole in the canopy. That's why it starts with a star, except this is a really big star. It's a hole through to God. So that's what starts the whole story off. And then in, in the Gnostic versions, you get this explosion of light in the cave and Jesus is there. So the, the structure of the story is basically around the, um, the uh, baptism and the death and resurrection, which represent the 
psychic initiation, the soul initiation, and the spirit initiation. So he comes in, he is himself, he goes through the initiation himself, John the Baptist initiates him, and a dove comes down. The dove is Sophia. It's a, it's a very common motif for the goddess. She comes down into him. He's now the philosopher. And he now can initiate people, which he, which he starts to do. And God's pleased with him. And what he does then is in the story, he gives all, so that's the psychic soul initiation. He gives all of the soul teachings. That's where he gives all of the lovely stuff, the Sermon on the Mount, love your neighbors, love your enemies, forgive people over and over and over again. All of these incredibly powerful confronting ideas, which are not, you know, they're confronting to us today. Imagine it 2000 years ago in a brutal Roman empire. These are these are radical, radical ideas. He gives all of those. And then let's jump to the second initiation because I don't want to take too so long. There's lots of stuff in the middle. Oh, I'll just say one thing. The, the, the 12 disciples. What are the 12 disciples? Well, it's a it's, it's zodiac, isn't it? It's obvious. So if you go to Mithras, another god man, he's in the middle and he has these seven animals around him and that's the zodiac. And in this one, you get Jesus in the middle. And who, who are the, who, the, the, that's the wheel of suffering. You know, like in the East, except in the West, it's called the wheel, wheel of grief. That's what uh, Pythagoras calls it. You're stuck on the wheel, going round, reincarnating, reincarnating, and you need to realize there's a still point in the center. And just to make that clear, in the Gnostic, one of the beautiful Gnostic things called the round dance, we have Jesus standing in the center with the 12 disciples dancing around him, and he says things and they repeat it, and he says things and they repeat it in this dance. Because he's the still point. And that comes from astrology, because in the, in the sky there is a still point, which is the, the pole star. And the, everything, see, it, only because of the relationship between the earth, of course, really, but it looks like the whole of the sky is turning around this still point. Well, Jesus is, is the still point. Your own center of being is the still point. The, the still point of the turning world, if you know T.S. Eliot, which he took from Plotinus, who is a contemporary in the pagan world of all the Gnostics. So they are the signs of the zodiac. Uh, they're also all the ways you could get lost. So a little aside here before we move on, the, the, in the Gnostic traditions, the men are all stupid because they're all the ways you can get lost. And the great initiate is Mary Magdalene, who's then called the Apostle to the Apostles because she is redeemed. So let's go back to the, the, the myth of Sophia. She is, the, she's taken and she's taken, remember she has seven demons thrown out of her. Well, that's your seven chakras. That's not actually an Eastern system. You have that in Mithraism in the West as well. So that's the, you, she's freed of these levels and then she becomes Sophia. She becomes wise. So that later on, she's going to be the one that finds the empty tomb because she's now the wisest for Sophia. She's the wise soul. And then when Jesus dies in books like the Pistis Sophia, which means faith wisdom, she will teach the 12 disciples the true mysteries. That's her role. That's how important she is. And it's also why so many of the books are written in the names of women. It doesn't mean they were necessarily written by women. They might have been because no one wrote under their own name. They all attributed it to somebody in the myth. So we've redeemed Mary Magdalene. She has she interest. So what, if you remember, there's so much in there. I, I mustn't get too distracted. If you remember, she is, she has, she's redeemed. She's taken through the seven levels. And then she washes his feet and proclaims him and she anoints him. Well, Christ means literally the anointed one. So that's the soul. The soul is now redeemed, which means he is now the Christ. He's now the king because he's redeemed the soul. That's what each one of us has to do. We have to clear and purify ourselves. That's the soul initiation. And when we're pure enough, we can transcend and become one in Christ. What, as Paul says, there's one Christ, there's one body. And so what happens next is he comes in to Jerusalem as the king. Now, in, 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 uh, in Egypt and Egyptian mythology, the, the, the devil is your body, your, your lusts and your body limitations is signified by a donkey, set. 
and they they up until quite recently they would kill donkeys regularly because it was a sacrifice to to, to get rid of the demons and so he comes in riding his donkey he has mastered his body he is free he is the master and everyone hallelujah hallelujah and it looks like everything's great but actually it's leading to a completely new initiation and that's true with us too you think you've you know oh, i'm getting the hang of this and then bang oh my god there's a whole new level which is the the, the pneumatic or the the non-dual revelation and that's going to be symbolized as it was in the ancient world a lot by death and resurrecting it's an old shamanic motif which you'll find in all those cultures too you have to die and come back to life interesting the word resurrection anastasis in the greek also means awaken you're asleep and you have to wake up so you have this then it leads to his betrayal and then you're you're really taking the idea that you'll find later in stoicism how would the philosopher deal with suffering well let's take the philosopher and let's torture him let's have him betrayed by all of his friends what does he do well in this story he forgives he goes I, they don't you, you don't you they don't know what they're doing because he has the gnosis he has the knowledge to see that they're doing this through ignorance so he's able to take love to this extreme and that picks up on that's what this period of easter is about it's about this incredible ability to love through suffering which seems really important right now that's what the story has always been about and what it's represented and in the gnostic version we have this incredible image sometimes called the laughing jesus because it says he his body is on the cross suffering but the real jesus is in a is in a cave of light laughing saying i, I i'm free because i don't identify with this what i appear to be i'm more than that because i know i'm more than that i am free so two or three little motifs to end with this. In the, uh, you remember in the story, he dies and the veil of the temple is ripped in two. The veil in the temple in, in, in Jerusalem at that time was a tapestry of the night sky. All of these religions are astrological religions because the night sky is the biggest thing in town. It's a tapestry of the night sky. So what's it saying? It's saying that when jesus died he the cosmos was ripped and he went through the veil to the treasure house of light he went to god and paul says and this is an interesting phrase he conquered the cosmos he came out of form and that's the non-dual realization he went back out and he was free that's the pneumatic initiation and then we have Easter. Uh, now let's just do one little thing before Easter. In the Gospel of John, first of all, the Gospel of John is not the Gospel of John. None of the Gospels had names. The Gospel of John has been added much later. But the person who claims to write the Gospel of John calls themselves the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple is Mary Magdalene. She is the goddess. She is his other half it's the gospel of the beloved disciple we have a lovely we have a lovely little fragment this is just a joke but it's true we have a fragment. you know i told you we got lots of these little fragments one of the fragments has got a tear on it and we just got the little bit and the bit we've got just reads jesus loved mary more than all the other disciples and often used to kiss her on the <laughs> and, that, and that's the bit that's missing <laughs> which i think is just fabulous <laughs> anyway so none of these people are real bear that in mind these are all these are all mythological figures so that um so that uh, so that in the, in the at the end of the gospel of of john of the beloved disciple you you're meant to have john and mary mother mary before jesus had his feet it's not it's the two marys that's the whole point it's the two Marys are before him as he's dying. And what he says, it, it looks like some throwaway, like he's going, oh, um, John, look after my mum when I'm dead, will you? But he isn't. What he's actually saying is, he says, this is your parent, this is your mother, this is your child. And he's saying to the individual soul, can you see that you're one with the whole soul? 
That's what he's saying. And they, so he unites the two. He unites the individual soul with the cosmic soul. And then he says immediately after that, it is finished. He has come into this state of oneness and he can die. And then who is going to be the person who knows, who finds out that he's resurrected? Mary Magdalene. She's the wise soul. She's the great teacher. And she will arrive at the cave. Remember, it started in a cave. And now the cave is empty because he's conquered the cosmos. So there's a fantastic line in Plotinus, who was a rival of the Gnostics, a pagan teacher, a Neoplatonic teacher, very great teacher. Um, but he knew a lot of Gnostic Christians, obviously, and saw them as rivals. Um, and he says, well, this Gnosticism, it's just the same as what we teach. It's just teaching the Christianity, he says. Not, Christianity is, is it's all about the ascent from the cave. And you think, gosh, if someone had said that in a, in a church, or, oh, yeah, this is about the ascent from the cave, isn't it? It's like, what the hell? But it is. Can you see? It's exactly what it's about. He was there at the time. He could see it. It was obvious. It's about the ascent from the cave. We're in the cave. We're trapped. We're going to get out into the oneness. But here's the interesting thing. It doesn't end there. He comes back in the body. And this is huge because it's not just transcendence. The gnosis is coming back into the body. And that's the, that is the, what is called the mystical marriage. So the idea of the mystical marriage is it doesn't end with Jesus' resurrection. That's not the end of the story. It ends with the marriage of Jesus and Sophia, the coming together of soul and spirit, everything coming into a state of, of what I would call paralogical. They taught it as syzygies, something which is two and one at the same time. So there's something beautiful, I think, about this coming, to, coming back into the body, which is a, very much about that method, that, sto that teaching of love, you know, lo going out to the prisoners, going out to the suffering, going out to the poor. You know, if you help any one of these, you're helping me. All of that teaching is about the coming back into the body. So last thought, and then I, I'm very, I, I would love to get the chance to tell you what things I've taken and which bits I've changed, but I think I'll just pause because I've been talking for an hour, 50 minutes. A bit more, uh, 50 minutes. Is the whole purpose behind all of this allegory is for us to discover the Christ within. And there's a brilliant little Gnostic book we have bits of called The Treaties of the Resurrection which could be translated the book of waking up. That's a perfectly accurate translation. Just sounds a bit more modern, doesn't it? And in the book of waking up, it basically goes, when will the resurrection happen? It says, when will the resurrection happen? Not by waiting for it. The resurrection is already here. You are already resurrected. Free yourself from the duality that binds you and you will know already you are resurrected. So what this is all about is exactly the stuff we've been doing with the deep awake work. And what the Gnostics did was what I'm trying to do with individualism. They took what was already there and they gave it a big kick forward. And they created something which was so beautiful and so powerful that it is still echoing down the centuries today with a message which is still confronting, despite being used for most horrible things, despite for all of the awful things which the uh, Catholic Church has done, still it has inspired most of the best things in Western culture, has come from this Gnostic spirit, which in turn was building on the pagan spirit, of which it is a, 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 a sibling, not a rival, a development of. And that's what we're doing at Easter. That's what we're doing. We're remembering that we can die and resurrect. And what we die into is the oneness and what we resurrect as is love, the Christ. So that there's Diane Christ and Marianne Christ and Phil Christ and John Christ and Rick Christ and Tim Christ and Lars Christ, George Christ, all these, that's, that's who we are. That's who we are. And that's the essence of what it is to be a individual.
is to know that, but not to disappear into it, but to find it, to know it, and then to come back from it to engage with the love. <laughs> so let me have a quick look. Um, hmm. Yeah, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, Greg. That's right. Going into the age of Aquarius, Greg has written, and 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 you know, really, this 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 seems, you know, I I I. I I don't want to remotely sound grandiose because, you know, I'm one guy and we're a tiny little group and all the rest of it. But, you know, but so were they. <laughs> you, know? you know, who were these people? They were oddballs like us um, who, who stuck their neck out and, and, they, and took the ancient wisdom from wherever they could find it and went, oh, this is good and let's do this with it. And here's a new idea. And, and we're willing to, you know, one of the things I love about the ancient Gnostics is you were not regarded as an initiate until you had written your own myth. So you didn't believe what other people did. You, you found it in yourself. That's how you showed the teacher you understood that you could speak the language of mythology. And what I've been trying to do here is exactly what was done by the Gnostics as we entered the age of Pisces. They laid down the foundation for the age of Pisces. What I want us to do, make no mistake about it, and I know it sounds grandiose, and I'm sure it's not just us. There's lots of other people. I bloody hope so. There's lots of Gnostic groups, like there were then. But what I'm trying to do with Univigilism is lay down the new mythos for the age of Aquarius, which we are exactly in the same relationship to as they were with the age of Pisces. And that requires a new thing. And that's this trans-scientific, paralogical, evolutionary, emergent spirituality. So... Uh, does anyone want to pick up and ask me something or shall I just launch into what we've kept and what we haven't kept? If there's anyone really wants to say anything, I'm getting go for it by, by Scott there. Maybe I'll do that because it feels like um, we've entered into that now. So the key thing which has stayed the same, which is why this is, an, in my view, it's a neo-Gnosticism. I don't use that name much. And the reason I don't is because when I wrote the books, people wanted me to speak, you know, to set up a church. A lot of people thought I was going to have bishops and Gnostics and blah, 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 and we do it. And it's like, no, 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 not that again. <laughs> no, and, and, and a lot of Gnosticism is seen very negatively. And you know what? Because some of it is very negative. They don't have a very nice view of the world. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. And not, a, not you know, but hey, one shouldn't be surprised. What, one of the things I'm often talking about, you'll hear me a lot, is going... We must understand history, because if you do, you realize how bad life was. You know, if, if most people are, you know, most of your kids are dying before you, the age of five, you don't know, you know, you're living in a, amongst, in, with a level of casual brutality that it's really hard for us to imagine. You know, no dentists is the example that always makes me think. It's like, ah, no dentists. I mean, just, that, it's hard, not hard to see why you'd look at the world of toil and strife and go, this is the devil's playground. And our job is to get out, which is why the Gnostics and not just the Gnostics, but also the Hindus, uh, all of them, they saw this as a place to try and get away from into the non-dual. That was part of it. That was part. And then you come back as service. But that, you know, but that was the idea. But what we've done is we've turned that around. So the biggest change, the biggest thing that stayed the same, Gnosis. The key thing is that we have that experience. That's the deep awake state to find that deep place where you meet God. The three levels of identity are just a description of what's obvious. Interesting for those that know my work, when I did, it's, you know, one must maybe confess some stuff. You come to this through your own lens, obviously. So I was heavily influenced by Eastern philosophy. So when I was trying to make sense of the word spirit, I thought, what does that really mean? It means essence or being. I'm going to use the word consciousness. And I use that word because that's what people who wrote about Hinduism used. So I put it all in terms of consciousness. But I think I was completely wrong. Now, I don't think they meant consciousness at all. I think they meant being, which is what this word really means. And so I've gone back to that now. 
consciousness, it becomes conscious. So those three things, your, your sens the sensory world of the body, the imaginal world of the soul, and then the being, which is everything and nothing. So that stayed the same. The, the centrality of love, of agape, of service, you know, love your enemies. Is there, is there a line in the whole of literature to compare with that? Love your enemies. Wow. I mean, wow. Love your, I mean, that's it. That's, that is the biggest call to love. How many times should you forgive somebody? 70 times seven. Wow. What should you do if someone takes something for you? Give them something else as well. Wow. What should you do if someone hits you? Say, hey, you hit me again. These are massive ideas which are just as relevant now. And our job is to carry those, carry those through. And then my, my notion of God. So they, they were thinking in their time. So they had this problem, which was the Jewish God, Yahweh. So they were unable to go, well, he doesn't exist. They couldn't think that thought. He obviously existed to them, but he was a horrible God. He's a jealous God. He, he sent plagues on people. Their God was a God of love. So what they did is they turned Yahweh into a fallen God. And he was the creator of this fallen world. And that explained why it was such a mess. And they had to free themselves from his tyranny and get back to the real God, who is the God of love. So that was the way they rationalized it. What I've done, and you know, the idea of God as Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, that comes from Christianity. And it was meditating on that line that I first went, oh, this is not coming from God, it's going to God. It's coming from being, and it's becoming God. So that's very much indebted to, to that thought. It's a different way of dealing with the problem of suffering to them. They had a bad God. I say, get rid of that. That, you'll often hear me attacking that God, going, look, if the God, who, the God who created this is an idiot and, a, and not very nice and, you know, five complete extinctions and he doesn't know what he's doing. So forget that God. And we now have this beautiful idea they didn't have of evolution. We have this huge idea of cosmic history and that changes everything. So we can now see it's coming towards this, that the universe is flowering into God which resolves the Gnostic problem in a new way. The other thing which I think is key to individualism is a rejection of authority. I'm, I, you know, you'll never hear me try, and I hope I never do, set myself up as anything. I make suggestions, I give it my best shot. I try and, try and be the best I can, I usually fail. That's a Gnostic spirit. Find it for yourself, respect everyone, and share with others and be willing to be inspiring, but not to, not to seek spiritual authority in that way. Awakening in the body, hugely important to me. We've been through this because we rejected the world. Most spirituality rejected the body. We've now turned that around. We've, turned, we've literally turned the world into a place you would want to live in, where most of us are having a pretty good life. And we can now return to the body and go, oh, this is a good thing. This is great. Let's take care of it. And so we have a different relationship. We can still understand we're really the soul, but my relationship between soul and body is I want, as a soul, I want to take care of my body and I want to enjoy it and embody this. And there's the essence of that is still, is still there in the idea of the resurrection of the body. But I'd say the biggest change is, I, is that their, their cosmology was one of emanation. So you have a cosmic principle and from it comes, it falls. It kind of, it's the opposite of uh, evolution. So it starts with God and then it falls, 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 falls and falls until it ends up with matter. And then we have to escape. Whereas the new evolutionary perspective goes, no, it starts with the simplest and it evolves upwards. So it's much more optimistic. It doesn't see you falling down and trapped and need to escape from this horrible place. It goes, no, we need to create heaven on earth. We need to reach towards the good. Uh, but it's the same basic idea. It's just turned on its head. And it turns from something which is negative into something uh, which is positive. And then the other biggest thing, and this is my last thing with it, <clears throat> is it was the whole Gnostic idea is that you would study the myths, immerse yourself in the myths, and you would have revelations. And that's exactly what happened to me. When Peter and I were working on this, I just 
completely just lost myself in all of these myths and theology and I had all of these rev revelations um, which were either in there or I saw them in there probably a mixture of the two in complete honesty but one of the key things that I started to emerge from me is the a central idea which is absolutely central to me which is that the process we're on the evolutionary process the process of existence is going from unconscious oneness through conscious individuality to conscious oneness which is both and that's the essence of what i think why it doesn't start with consciousness it starts with unconscious being it becomes conscious being and then it can be conscious of being everything and that's the individual and all of that is the very first time that i i um explored that idea was in the book jesus and the goddess which i think is one of my best books for all of this and here we are now neo-gnostics seeing can we create it can we do what they did the great mistake in all of this is to try and repeat what they've been doing as if just the key thing is to really repeat what they're doing is to be innovative because why they were interesting is they innovated they took things forward and that's what we need to do all right my lovers if you would like to speak either take off your um your mic or wave at me and let's spend the, le the time we've got left chewing over some of that scott Oh, I just yeah. before you, before you start, Scott. I just need to tell you that I can't see everybody's. We've got so many people. I can't see everyone's face. So um, you you if you if I, if you if you're waving and I'm ignoring you, it's because I can't see you. In which case, just start speaking. Scott, start us off. Yeah, it's just it's really powerful, and um, and that's that's the point of I think the, the literalist uh, movement of the second century, as you so named it, is that the. the it loses the power. There's, there's no power. I, I, I preach this Anglican Episcopal priest and uh, was preaching the Gnostic gospel yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, and the point of the resurrection is it's, it's a now thing. It's not in the future. And, and when you take it literally, you, it has no power. There's, there's no power in a literal understanding of, of, of physical res resuscitation of the, re the resurrection. It has to be uh, a mythical understanding and that's when you're talking about an experience that uh that moves you from the physical understanding of the world to a more conscious understanding of the world words are not enough so you need a myth to make you break through like you experienced when you were writing your exactly book. exactly uh, and so i think it's really powerful that we uh, we're working on vocabulary here with this group but it's also very important to remember that it's really the myths that are going to bring most people to a greater understanding. And that's part of what I think your workshop and, and the work that you do is exactly. to bring a more mythical understanding. So, yeah, you know, I think, I think the key thing is Scott, it's the clarity of the story. Mm, it's like, yeah. like criticizing the old doesn't go too far. What people need is a better story. So what yeah. I'm trying to do is what I'm writing now. What I try to do with self story and the next one I'm doing it now is if we can tell a, a better story, about what this is people will go oh yeah i like that story that works that works that explains my experience yeah i'm i'm just thinking there are some questions here so i'm going to just pick up on these questions because people have asked them if that's okay um so we've got uh uh tatiana uh why are the literalists so violent why have the literalists felt historically and now so threatened um look i think the reason is I can see you, you're right in the middle of my screen, hello. Um, uh, the, I think the reason is if once you've, once you do, it's, it's like what happens over and over again, once you see it, it's everywhere, is we embed ourselves in an idea about the way that reality is, and then we pay the consequences for those ideas if we don't question them. So once you have the idea that there is one way to God, and that if you don't take it, your soul is damned forever, you will do anything to try and enforce that and if necessary to save people's soul by burning them at the stake it is so grotesque and yet if you really have that idea which is what we ended up with then 
you can, you know, I think this is why they become so, and, and literalism is, you know, that is what fundamentalism is. It's like, it's pulling it down to something which is you're sure of. Whereas at the heart of Gnosticism, you're not sure of anything. It's the mystery of God. That's the only thing you're sure of. Um, is ego consciousness prior to initiation equivalent in some way to the demiurge? Yes. Uh, who's that? Eric. So yes, in the sense that uh, ego, of just being trapped in yourself, of being egotistical. That's exactly right. That's the way that I think they interpreted it. That the, 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 what, that narrow selfish thing in you, which was the, the dumb bit, that in the cosmos, that was Yahweh. That was the demiurge. And this earth was a product of that. Uh, if and when you are asked what are you and a person shares that they are Catholic what do you say? <laughs> I like to say a freelance monothe monotheist that's very good this is a concept from Karen Armstrong that's right um, uh, what do I say I am? I, I mean maybe now I'd say I'm a univigilist um, because I've got a word that I made up I had to make it up because I didn't have one. Um, but the, the way that I bridged the gap, and you can imagine that when I wrote this book, it, it was, I did get a lot of, uh, you know, it's true, but we, it, it's kind of funny, but it is true. We didn't have any death threats, but we had an awful lot of after death threats. It's like, you know, when, when, when Peter and I die, we're going to be tortured forever by a God of love <laughs> for saying the wrong thing, allegedly. Um, but what I would do and I still do it with Christians. It's easier with Christians because I just go, well, you know what? Jesus said, love your enemies. So we can agree on one thing, which is we love each other and then start the conversation from there. And then people say nice things about me and my presentation. So that's great. All right, let's, uh, we've got, uh, yes, Stephen. Thank you. I'm going to ask everyone to keep their questions and comments as brief as you can, because we've got so many of us. Hi. Yeah, very powerful and very interesting. There was one bit I particularly loved when you were saying Jesus, uh, as he was being crucified, had the wisdom to disassociate himself from his body. So that's why he would kind of succeeded in that ascension, because he didn't associate himself with his body. Could we fast forward to now and yeah. the, the terrible images we see of people dying of coronavirus where you feel like you're drowning. Is it possible for humans, just ordinary humans, to disassociate themselves from that feeling of drowning to death? Is that possible? I mean... It's definitely possible because I know people who, who can do that. And I, I have a very close friend who um, went through an extraordinary experience where he... Uh, was very stupidly doing tombstoning in South America, jumping off, you know, into water from high places and took his leg off. So that was pretty awful. And then he was rushed to hospital. And that's when he discovered for the first time that, that painkillers don't work on him. So he had to go undergo the whole operation and everything without any anesthetics. And what he found was by the end was that actually, yeah, he could actually transcend the whole thing. And it's, it's a, it's a full on story. I hope none of us, and certainly I hope that I don't ever have to find that out. Um, but yeah, you can, and, and yogis can do it. Um, it. I'm not sure I could do it, but it, one thing I know I can do, and, it, and this is part of what we can do together in the deep awakenings, is you can become familiar through meditation, which is really that theory of taking your attention and sinking it into your depths there is a place of great peace and safety behind all of the sensations and all of the thoughts. There is a, there's a profound deep stillness and love. There's God and spiritual practice, not a term I use much or like much really, but that it is about developing a fac faculty of a facility to be able to do that. And if we do that in good times, it's more easy to do it in the hard times. I, you know, I don't underestimate how hard. And also we you know when the body is in distress or, you're going through things like the coronavirus. I imagine it's incredibly difficult, which is why the key thing for me is always compassion. Um, lots of lovely comments coming in. Uh, uh, let's, is there somebody else? I, I can't see anyone's movement. I'm moving between screens here. 
Okay, let me look at these comments. Um, what is the Holy Spirit, Marianne? Yes, great question. Where are you? I can't see you, but you're here somewhere. There you are. Um, the Holy Spirit is Sophia. It's the, it's the feminine. So the, quatern, the quaternity is, mo, is, is father, mother, which is that, if you like, if you use, if you use the simple terms, it's consciousness and form, or being and form, uh, or dreamer and dream, if you like. That's the uh, father and mother. And then that in us is soul and, and spirit, being. And um, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is the cosmic Sophia. That's, that's the, the other aspect of that. And it became Latinized into spiritus, which it took on a male uh, name. But in, in, in earlier things, it's, it's feminine. So it's the missing, it's the missing feminine. You know, you've got to look at it and your Christianity and you go, there's something missing. <laughs> you've got three men. I mean, I know the, the Holy Ghost hasn't got a body or anything, but it's still a man, isn't it? <laughs> it's still a spiritus. <laughs> and that's because that's it's, it's been removed because they haven't involved Mary and they've removed, they've changed the, the gender of the Holy Spirit. I think that's what it is. I think it's, it's a quaternity. So, let me have a last look down here. All right, so what I think we might do on this Easter um, to end our time together. I hope it's been of value, uh, of interest to see where our tradition that we brought, we grew up in came from, but also to see where this new thing, which we're trying to give birth to, what it is and why it feels like, you know, look, this is important and we need to do it well. Um, oh, one last question from Ronnie. How do you interpret, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isn't that the most poignant moment? I love that moment in the story. Because the great thing about Jesus is he's portrayed also as human. And I think that's a key moment. It's a bit like the moment you're talking about with the suffering. It's like there's a moment there where, you know, and, and that's the dark night. That's the, and that's part of the initiatory process. That moment where you feel abandoned, where you feel lost. The, the dark just before the dawn. And I hope, bringing it up to now, I hope that we might be going through that right now. Because it's certainly dark. And strange. And there's certainly suffering. And my hope is that we can come back from this. So here's my thought to really bring it up to now on this Easter. What we're doing, you know, I, I, the, someone asked me once, what's my mission? And, you know, it's like I could have said, oh, to be a philosopher and to write philosophy and all of that's true. But really, the thing which I feel I, I want to be part of is empowering the goodness in us that there is a great goodness in us, there is God in us, the part of you that wishes well for everyone, that's the God in you, that's the Christ, that big, big love. And I want us to bring that out. And, that me, and, that, and what we're in right now is a period of definitely of transition, of instability. And we're gonna come out of this, I hope, at some point, soonish, I hope. And we're gonna come into a world where nothing is formed in the way it was. And that can be disaster, or that can be the beginning of something amazing. And the thing which will decide which it is, is how many people like you and me go, we want it to be better. We want a world of more love, of more wisdom, 
of treating each other in new ways, of valuing different things, all of that. So the reason, you know, that I've gathered the ICU together, you know, it's not to be a Tim Freak fan club or to, you know, make money. It doesn't do any of those things. It's to try and build like they did, like Valentinus did, like Simon Magus did, like all of them. And together with like-minded kindred spirits, literally, to get the experience as best we can, to support each other in that, you know, our frail humanity as best we can, and to articulate a new story and to get it as good and as clear as possible so it lays the foundation for that new world. And, and it's happening right in front of us. Something's happening. And that's about unleashing the goodness in us. And that's what the Gnostics were about too. Plato was, the, it's all going to the good. And, and we have to do that consciously now. That's my feeling. So join me for a moment, these last few moments. Just close your eyes for a second, dear friends. Feel your body, how lovely that is to have a body. To be alive. Gratitude to the body. And then the soul, the psyche, everything that makes you you. Your story, your memories, your hopes and fears, your visions, your creativity. And then sinking right back into that still presence at the very depths of what you are, your being. Which has no other quality than being. It just is. And because it has no quality but being, it is one with all being. We are one with all beings individual and universal. And that's what 2000 years ago, a man called Paul called the Christ within you. And that's what I'm calling your individuality. That you're an individual coming into conscious oneness with the universe. And when I'm in that place and I look back onto the world, it feels like love, agape. This all embracing love for everything, no enemies love for enemies. And let's feel that love at Easter, at the time of the resurrection, the awakening, the death and resurrection. Coming out of duality to the oneness and then back in as a servant of love. And I'll leave you with these two thoughts. Jesus is portrayed as teaching in the world of Judaism in which there are a hundred rules and regulations. And he says there are only two and the second is much like the first. The first is love God. Love the most emergent thing in the universe. Be one with the most emergent goodness. And the second, which is much like the first, is love others as yourself. Because they are.
And then finally, my favorite quote from a Gnostic gospel you may not know, from the Gospel of Philip, where it says, those who are free because of Gnosis become slaves because of love. Those who are free because of Gnosis become slaves because of love. That's us, my friends. Let us wake up and become free and then let us give ourselves as servants to love. Thank you, everyone who took part. It's been a delight to spend this time with you. I'm going to undo your, your uh, oh, oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. I have one last uh, request, actually, folks. I've just remembered because I got so carried away. Uh, I want to do an experiment with Zoom about Zoom rooms. So if you've got, if you've got 10 minutes to hang, off, hang out and help me with that before you go, hang on. If you're done, the meeting's done and uh, we're just going to do that afterwards. Go well. Enjoy Easter Monday. See you next week. I'm going to be doing next week myself because I can't do the week after. So next week we'll really plug into univisualism and where this is going now. I love you. So hang up, hang, hang, out, hang out for another bit more. Otherwise, thank you. Just log out. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, we will move our intruder long before they come to blows. And our resident. Yeah,